Hey guys, welcome back to Cult of Film. Uh, today we have a familiar face helping me out on a review, and I this is this is I'm really excited about this episode because we're reviewing uh, a movie that is from the nucleus of my childhood, um, and from probably one of the most influential directors in my life. We are reviewing Big Trouble in Little China from 1986 from the great John Carpenter with the great Noah. How are you, man? Hey, guys. Good to see you. Taking a little little break there, uh, but it's really good to be back on the pod. Uh, I miss you, Kyle. I love you, brother. And yeah, this will be my first um, cult of film where we review the movies. Uh, it took me, you know, about 20 years to watch the movie, but uh, <laughs> You know, it's uh, it's all good. Um, I really enjoyed it. I was surprised by how much I, uh, you know, enjoyed it. You know, that's no knock, but I, you know, I looked at the, the poster and I kind of read a few things and I thought, ah, I don't know. But I watched it and it was such an interesting film. It incorporated all the things I love about movies. It was kind of a like a weird fusion of Western and martial arts film, Chinese sort of yeah. Uh, thing there and it was awesome i mean yeah like you said 1986 so it's you know it's a good 40 almost 40 year old film but it still plays up today and man it was a great movie thanks for uh recommending that i'm glad i'm glad you enjoyed it it's um you know i i felt like you might you know you know knowing you as i do you know have, have an idea of the of stuff you enjoy yeah and but you know, it, it's you never know. Sometimes it's it's a miss. But this is, in my view, and I've watched everything John Carpenter has ever directed. Yeah, this is, I think, technically, in terms of just the <clears throat> one, the audacity of it, to the creativity of it, and just the technical skill uh, of his genius. I think it is his best film. Oh, and really? That, Wow. It, it surprises it surprises a lot of people because wow. I think a lot of people because a lot of people know not a lot of people know Big Trouble in Little China. People know Halloween, people know Starman, people know Escape from New York, people know In the Mouth of Madness, but not a lot of people know Big Trouble in Little China. And that's because this movie it's it's crazy. You you look back <clears throat> at John Carpenter's career this is a guy who studied all the greats, literally was at USC, USC Film School, yeah. and it had guest instructors like John Ford, Orson Welles, uh, <clears throat> all the greats. He absorbed as much as he could and actually didn't even graduate, just took off, started making movies. Yeah. And there's at least at least two moments in his career where we look at his filmography now and yeah. it's just like he created, he, he in so many ways created genre. Like we would not know the horror slasher genre today without what he did with Halloween. We, yeah. wouldn't, we wouldn't know a lot of the sort of siege films yeah. um, as we know them today without Assault on Precinct 13, Escape from New York, Prince of Darkness, Wait, wait, was but, it Escape from New York or Escape from L.A.? Well, Escape from L.A. was the sequel oh, um, that they right, did. Right, so they, right. did escape, they did Escape from New York in, I think, 81 or 82. Okay. And then they did Escape from L.A. in 95 or 96. Okay. A lot of people rag on Escape from L.A. because in, in many ways it's sort of the same. It's exact, almost the exact same story huh. that was, they did in New York, only they said it in L.A. Yeah. I didn't care because I was getting... I was getting John Carpenter teamed up with Kurt Russell again. I'm like, I don't, yeah. I don't care what they do. I'm in, and it's a yeah. fun movie. Um, but with Big Trouble in Little China, it was the second time in Carpenter's career where he produced, he directed a movie that should have been the movie of the year. Should have been a blockbuster, yeah, just mass murdering hit. Okay, um, and. Sure. The first one was John Carpenter's The Thing. The Thing is a remake of The Thing from Another World from the 1950s. And okay. he remade it. <clears throat> People who saw it were blown away by it. 
fans of the original thing from another world were disgusted by it because it's a very graphic alien film. It's actually the best alien horror film ever made. We know that now, but that film was, I don't think lasted in the theaters for a series of months, much like Blade Runner in the same year, two <laughs> movies that have been critically reappraised as absolute masterpieces, absolute classics. Yeah, and, and Carpenter was, he was written off. All the critics hated the thing. And it's now held as one of the most incredible sci-fi uh, films ever made. And then the same thing happened basically again with Big Trouble in Little China. Big Trouble in Little China, um, Kurt Russell, action movie, huge hit, kung fu themes, all this. This had every, everything um, that should have been a massive, massive hit in 1986 and i think what, it, what based on what i what i recall is it had a massive budget for marketing and something happened either with the studio or there was another movie that was coming out i don't know if it was an indiana jones film or something along those lines something else came out and the studio slashed the marketing budget so mm. any big m media push with billboards commercials radio yeah. ads um <clears throat> ads and magazines and comic books was was wiped yeah. away well yeah and i was, so one, this I was movie, curious about the budget so i looked it up and the budget I mean, the was budget, something the like 20 was, million the budget, and then uh what's that the budget for the movie the budget for the movie was huge it was the marketing budget that they that they cut which killed it nobody right. knew the budget, they for the movie, they the budget okay go ahead yeah no sorry they, the they, budget they, for the movie was twenty million, and then the it looks like the box office was like ten. Right, and that's because it wasn't the production budget that was the issue. The problem was the marketing budget. They spent the twenty million on the movie, and then instead of dropping another what two to five million to market the film, they just cut that budget completely. It went into the theaters. It came and went. Nobody really knew about it. But what ended up happening was you had the VHS rental revolution in the 80s. So even if a movie didn't necessarily <clears throat> get its due in the theater, you had a lot of movies that ended up becoming huge hits off of home video. And that's exactly what happened with Big Trouble in Little China. It was a massive, massive, massive hit in video rentals as well as on premium cable. I remember seeing this movie on... HBO and then on other cable, you know, networks as a kid. Um, and it ran pretty regularly. I'd see it on all the time for at least a decade. And it has kind of become critically reappraised like other films of his and, and, you know, frankly, you know, other movies. And it has sort of a place in not just Kurt Russell fandom, but it's really held as just a textbook example of how you do a fun sort of Raiders of the Lost Ark style action film. Yeah, mixed with a bunch of uh, really good choreographed uh, martial arts scenes. I mean, I wasn't expecting it to have that much martial arts in it. I really wasn't. Um, right. I was surprised by how good it was as far as the choreography. Um, I mean, it really rings true for like legitimate Kung Fu uh, moves. And it wasn't super you know kind of fake and and like you know right. like weird uh fake it was uh it was good and yeah i loved it well carpenter i mean <clears throat> you can kind of divide i i feel like you can sort of carpenter was at the height of his powers basically from when he started in the mid 70s i would say maybe through to early to mid 90s and by the mid 80s, the guy was just cooking, just cooking. Yeah. And there was, he was, he wasn't going to. One thing about John Carpenter's, he, he didn't cut corners, um, even if he lost budget, even if he lost battles with studio execs or producers. He figured out a way to make things authentic. And he was not going to make a movie as a white dude including things like Chinese culture and half acid. He wasn't going to do it. And that's something that um, something else he has said in um, recent years in terms of interviews, 
that it wasn't meant to be a Kurt Russell vehicle. Like you look at the poster and it's Kurt Russell. It was, it's, it's really, if you, if you look at it, obviously Kurt Russell is sort of, he's our everyman. He is us going into this world of intrigue and magic and sorcery. But it's really an, it's a ensemble cast. You have Dennis Dunn, who is at least as, as important, if not more important, as the character of Wang, as Kurt Russell is, as Jack Burton. You've got James Hong, as um uh, as a Lopan, who was oh, right, right. unbelievable. You got Kim Cattrall, all that. Um, it's 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 obviously Kurt Russell is there, but he's he's not the hero. He's kind of a fuck up. You know, he's he's sort of stumbling into all of it, and it's his friends around him that are helping him through. Yeah. Yeah. No, hundred um, percent. You know. And even the guy, the, uh, what was his name? Egg, Egg Shen, Egg something Egg Shen, like yeah. that. He was mm -hmm. good too. Um, it was interesting to see him without makeup at the end. Uh, looked completely different. Um, yeah, I mean, when I first when I first put it on, I was like, my God, this is just, this can't be like that good. But because of the, the beginning where, where like he's in the truck, it's raining, there's thunder. Um, like the first lines, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be so cheesy, but, uh, it wasn't, it prevailed. Um, I don't know what your take was on the acting. I'd like to hear your take on the acting. Um, I, I thought the acting was good. I, I, you know, the Kim Cattrall character, it took me a while to start to like her in the movie. Um, I thought it was a little cheesy at certain times, the way she would uh, deliver the lines. But by the end of the film, I really did appreciate what she had done. Um, and yeah, it was it was an interesting it was an interesting thing to follow along. Um, it it uh, yeah, it starts out with you know this dude that you know he places a bet and um, he basically just wants to make sure that he gets his money. And so he follows the, the character, Dennis, uh, fuck, I'm oh, blanking Wang. on the guy's, I'm blanking on the guy's character name right now. Wang. Uh, Wang. Wang. Wang, right. Um, and he follows him to the airport um, to make sure, you know, and Wang's fiance is there. And yeah, it, one thing I did appreciate out of it is that it just, it, right out of the gate, it got to business. It wasn't like this sort of lull and dragged out sort of thing where you're like, okay, where is this movie going? It was like, all right, this, this is, you knew where it was going right away. Well, this is, this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why John Carpenter is so beloved by audiences and his fans and maybe not so much loved by critics or industry is every single one of his films Basically, it's as if the movie has already started and yeah. they they drop us as the viewer into someone's life that's already been going. And it's like, oh, here we go. And, and yeah. we're, we're off to the races. You're you're absolutely right. You know, we are you know, we're we're following Kurt Russell's character, Jack Burton. And right. yeah, he's, he's driving truck, meets up with his friend in Chinatown because he's, he's you know, he's dropping off a load. Um, yeah. His friend Wang, they're, they're old friends. Um, you know, they have a friendly bet. He loses. He decides to take his friend Wang to the airport to, you know, pick up his fiance who has flown in. And then the um, I'm trying to I can't remember what the name of the gang was, but uh, they're there with uh, also the Kim Cattrall character. Yeah, uh, they meet. Um, and basically Wang's girlfriend is immediately kidnapped. Yeah. And that basically sets up everything. And then it's basically yeah. just a big race to the end. Yeah. But it's a fun ride, and that's that's what Carpenter Carpenter does this, and so does Tarantino. Mm -hmm. is movies should be fun. Movies should be a fun ride with a great story, with colorful characters, with interesting, uh, fun uh, situations that they have to figure the way out of. And it's not necessarily about a message. It's not necessarily about high art. It's like Entertain me, motherfucker. Mm -hmm. I want to have time. I want to see good guys going up against bad guys. I want to see bad guys getting their ass kicked. I want to see the good guys win. I want to see them get the girl. 
And that's very much what um, we get in Big Trouble in Little China. Now, Carpenter isn't always so nice to his characters, uh, but he worked with Kurt Russell originally for, um, there was a 1970s film about Elvis, and Kurt Russell played Elvis. Originally, Carpenter was not set to direct it. The guy who I guess was set to direct it either quit or something happened. Carpenter took it, and Carpenter's a massive Elvis fan. So he ended up getting to know Kurt Russell really, really, really well. They became best friends, and then they would, they would continue to work with each other throughout their career. So you go Elvis, then Escape from New York mm -hmm. in 82, uh, Big Trouble in Little China, 86, and then Escape from L.A. in, I think, 95. And mm. you know they've been friends ever since, but they work really well together. And I feel like Big Trouble in Little China was just fun for them. I'm sure it was hard work. I'm sure they worked their asses off. But this is a movie that is just, <clears throat> I don't have to think too hard. I just need to enjoy it. I need to, tr I, I immediately just trust that we're on this adventure and we do, uh, and we just, we do it and we go for it. No yeah, yeah exactly. the and there wasn't there wasn't too many um, lulls where you're like, uh, right, let me check my phone, let me no. you know, let me go up and Not go up. take a piss or anything. It, it held you, it holds you along the whole way as as far as entertainment goes. Um, and there's some surprises oh, and and, and whatnot. Sorry, go ahead. You you asked me about what I thought of the acting. I'm yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, um, yeah. What do you think of the acting? What in terms of because I've watched everything he's done, yeah. um, I had no. I think this is the strongest acting of a lot of his films. He, yeah, Carpenter. Carpenter. <clears throat> I get the feeling sometimes in some of his films that the people who ended up being cast, not all of them, but some of them, I'm like, yeah, these were not his first choices. Yeah, uh, and I, I would say specifically. Um, his first big feature, Assault on Precinct 13 from 1975. Classic film, amazing film. One of the leads of that film, um, there's a black lead and a white lead. And the black lead is played by an actor named Austin Stoker. Solid actor. I believe everything he does. And then you have the white actor who is playing the, the other lead who is basically, um, he's a prisoner. And in my opinion, it doesn't work. The guy, what Carpenter needed Kurt Russell in that role, but he didn't know Kurt Russell yet. If Kurt Russell had been in that character, that it would have been a completely different. I mean, the film works, but that guy, it's, there's something very flat about that guy's delivery. And unfortunately, he's a co-lead. I think I kind of saw it again in Prince of Darkness. A couple of the actresses aren't... There's just, there's nothing there. And that, that's a massive cast. That's like yeah. seven or eight people. That's a, that's a kick-ass movie. That's the next one you should watch. It is the most clever devil movie I've ever seen. Uh, it was written, I believe, by Carpenter. Carpenter didn't always direct his own stuff. He would direct other people's stuff. Huh. But Prince of Darkness, despite a couple lackluster actresses, and I don't think it really shows. I see it because I drill in on that stuff. Great movie overall. Uh, super clever concept of the devil and of God. That's, okay. That's playing in this movie that I've never seen anybody ever do since. Um, hmm. And that's another one I had. It's again, it came out. He did Prince of Darkness the year after Big Trouble on Little China. Oh. So he was on this tear of super original genre films at the end of the 80s that just like, fuck, like it was just, he just, he was all over the place and it all worked. Um, yeah. But I would say of all of the stuff that he's done, Big Trouble in Little China in terms of total acting, yeah. strength, ensemble overall, um, yeah. absolute, absolutely knocked it out of the park. Um, I never had a problem with the Kim Cattrall character. This is the first I'm hearing about it. Um, she's supposed to be a neurotic white woman. And she fucking nails it in my in my. Yeah, you know, I, I, it may not even actually be like her level of acting. It might just be that the the character kind of like annoyed me a little bit at times. Mm -hmm. It's I I think it probably was more that she did a good job in annoying me as opposed right. to 
right? Like it probably right. wasn't bad acting. It was definitely like really uh, 80s acting, I felt like. Um, but it was more just like the film had an 80s fi- uh, feel. The music, the right. some of the shots <laughs> and, and the angles. Um, you know, like I said, by the end of the film, I liked her. Um, she's really attractive. The, honestly, the first time I saw her was in... Um, was later on in her right. acting career was in sex in the city. And I loved her in that. I mean, she, she played that role to a T as well. Um, and a very different, a very yeah. different character. Like, and that's the yeah. thing is most people don't, most people don't know Kim Cattrall before she blew up. And this is, yeah. you know, she had been working really steadily in feature films in the eighties, like from the late seventies through the early eighties then started yeah. getting bigger stuff. Like this should have been a film that launched a lot of people. But it, again, because for whatever reason, the marketing for the, the movie was cut. It just kind of came and went. Uh, but yeah, Kim Cattrall, people know her from, you know, people know her from Sex and the City. They don't yeah. know her from, you know, John Carpenter movies. But yeah, no, she, um, this is a very, yeah. The, the, what is it? Um, Gracie Law, the character of Gracie Law, the yeah. lawyer in the movie is 180 degrees away from the character of Samantha in Sex and the City. So I could yeah. see where, from your perspective, like, yeah. what? Yeah, <laughs> what no, 100%. Is, who is this? I'm, I'm, I'm not like critiquing it in a bad way. You know, I'm, I'm actually curious what your critiques would be as far as negative critiques or just well, neutral I critiques. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I don't, I really don't do. I don't review anything that I don't like because I don't okay. like to, I really don't like to neg. Um, if I, if I have but nothing, a, my only, my only criticism of this movie is really the, <clears throat> it's the broken heart of the nine year old boy that I was when I saw this movie, because like all John Carpenter films, John Carpenter ends films with a non ending. It's an ending, non ending where, yeah, he ends it like, oh shit. Like it's always a cliffhanger. Yeah. Um, and I remember watching this movie as a kid, falling in love with this movie. Yeah. And what 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 Carpenter did really well was he left you wanting more. Mm-hmm. Now, as a nine-year-old kid, I don't understand that. I'm just waiting for the sequel. And literally, I'm telling you, like through <laughs> throughout the 90s, I'm like, okay. They did Escape from L.A. There, there's gonna be a sequel to Big Trouble in Little China. We're gonna get yeah. this, and and of course there never was. Um, you know, and I it would be years before I would understand why. Like, why would he? And then you know, then I would delve into. I would go back and rewatch all of Carpenter's stuff. I'm like, oh, he ends all of his movies like there's gonna like there's like there should be ten more minutes. Yeah. All of his films end like there should be 10 more minutes. Like he drops you into somebody's life, the life of these characters, as the train is already moving, and he pulls you out as, 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 as the train is, 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 is still going. Yeah. So it's one of those things where he, he's, a, he's a king of Viva wanting more. So yeah. that, the, only, <clears throat> the only negative critique I would have isn't of him, it isn't of any of the actors, it isn't of any... Of the, the special effects are fucking great in this movie. They oh, yeah. absolutely are. They're all practical effects. And you know me, I worship at the altar of practical effects. Uh, but no, I think the, the biggest critique I have here is that the studio literally had no idea what they had. And right. the fact that they cut all the marketing for this film was proof that they didn't know what they had. So... Yeah, that's interesting. And it is interesting the correlation you made about the cliffhangers because yeah. now that I'm thinking about it, he does that in all the Halloween films. He's always like, Oh, what now? You know, <coughs> oh he's alive. Uh, you know, Michael's alive. Um, and then at the at the at the end of this movie it's the same thing. It's like that little that little mo- you know, the monsters under the truck and it's like, Oh no, what's gonna happen next? So right. that's interesting. Yeah, it's and I just to to not to um, not to correct you, but to correct you, of yeah. the, all of the Halloween movies that were ever made, the only one that he wrote, directed, and composed was the first one in '78. He did write 
and produce Halloween 2. He oh, did not my. direct it. So when he did the first Halloween, and, you know, Halloween has that ending where it's like, wait a minute, I saw him get shot. Where is he? Yeah. That was just, it, that was Carpenter as a young filmmaker, like, okay, how can I make this really interesting? How can I, he had no, that was, that, that no intention of, had no idea that Michael Myers would become so popular that it would become this yeah. franchise that would go on for 40 years. But it's one of those things where he would take that ending, non ending into all of his other films. And in so many ways, um, he gave the horror genre the ending, non ending. Like everybody's waiting now in so many horror films for there to be that twist at the end. And that really, it seems to me came from John Carpenter. Like, I'm trying to think through my through my Rolodex of all the like classic horror that I've watched, and I can't really think of too many films, at least American horror films, where you had that moment where oh shit, like the last minute something happened. Yeah, you have it in Halloween, and then you have it in the first Friday the Thirteenth movie at the very 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 end, and then it seems like everybody's been doing it ever since. But I don't know about that happening ever before. So, yeah, I wonder. I wonder. Um, I mean, another thing that came to mind is that did he write this screenplay or did he just direct it? You know, um, I don't think so. Let I me... think he might have just directed this one. I'm not. I'm not. Completely yeah, he sure. directed it. I've got it right here. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, because okay, written by Gary Goldman and David Z. Weinstein. Yeah. So yeah, this was not his. Right, um, but I mean, everything was crafted, you know, by him in in the. Oh yeah. The way it was he, made. He, he brought it to life. You know, I'm sure there were a lot of creative decisions that maybe weren't on the page that he, he added. Yeah. But it's just so fun. Oh, it was really good. I, you know, I, I've never heard of uh, Gary Goldman. Um, yeah, I don't know it, him either. It looks he, like um, he, he did, did Total Recall in 1990. He did um, Navy Seals in 1990. Um, yeah, it looks like after this, the the really the only thing he did was that Total Recall film with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which was um, a huge one. Yeah, that one was a was a a blockbuster. Um, right. And it looks like <laughs> the Minority Report was another one, which is interesting. Right. That was a that's a whole nother movie that was kind of weird this and is, wild. But. This is a it's a tough one. Like I, I you know I like obviously this guy got this guy got a few scripts made, but it's one of those things where I wonder how different it would have been for that guy if Big Trouble in Little China had been widely marketed. Yeah. And it reached more people. Like this is the the bitch of the eighties um, and right in the seventies as well was there was no internet. There was no way yeah. for if you were a director writer for you to defend something like if, if critics, if, if the big critics in the big newspapers decided they didn't like your movie or if, if Siskel and Ebert just decided it wasn't for them, it was just dead in the water. Yeah. And even if you had a ton, if your movie had a massive following, you know, and, yeah. and audiences loved it, there was no way for us to share about this, you know. Right. And yeah, so you it, couldn't do it. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. do little clips of it. You couldn't get yeah. different, you know, critics. It was literally like Ebert was right. basically the one that was telling you. Yeah, what you, had, I, so you had you had like you had uh, uh, Roger Ebert, Gene Siskel. You had um, oh, the guy, the crazy guy with the hair. I can't remember his name. He was based out of New York. But hmm. yeah, if those guys just weren't feeling it. They literally could end careers with one review. Yeah. And so you had people that would be super talented. They'd come and go. And you, you go back and watch these movies. I'm like, well, these people are really talented. Why didn't they do more? It's usually because of that. You know, and yeah, it's over, it is really or in the 80s, drugs. Yeah. You know, so just on one more note with the John Carpenter talk here. Um, what, you know, what, so what, uh, what what do you think he's best known for? Directing or screenplay writing? Um, I definitely definitely okay. Here he's he's a, he's a he's an interesting cat because he is as well known for the movies he's directed because he's directed so many 
genre classics and so many cult classics. Like I can't think of anybody who has more cult classics under his belt um, <clears throat> in, in American cinema. Yeah. But what's interesting, he's not, uh, well, he certainly, a lot of his hits were, and the things he directed, he did write. Like he did write Halloween. I believe yeah. he did write Escape from New York. Um, he, he wrote a lot of his stuff, not all of it, but it does seem that a lot of his, um, a lot of his hits that he directed, he also wrote. But more importantly, what, and if you know, if you're not a Carpenter aficionado, he did almost all of the scores for his films. Like, oh damn! People, we take it for granted now, but that's that that theme in Halloween, that entire score in the original yeah. Halloween. First of all, that movie dropped in 1978, which means it was filmed in 77. Right. That entire score, because he ran out of money. So people don't realize uh, Halloween was made for somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars. So yeah. up until up until the Blair Witch, it was the most successful independent film ever made. Yeah. They blew the money on what they had, and when it was initially screened. Halloween didn't have that dun, 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 dun. Yeah. There was that, that awesome, kick-ass, super scary yeah. synthesizer score wasn't yeah. there. And it actually, when they, they played it for an audience, and they're like, this isn't scary. And John Carpenter's like, hold my fucking beer. Turned around, cranked out the score in like a day. Yeah. Layered it in. Re, re, they, then, they, then they started... Uh, basically they had like a couple reels of it. They started literally driving the reel across the country. It didn't have distribution. They had to drive the fucker to theaters across the country. Once they had that score in there, people were losing their fucking minds. There's yeah. actually footage. There's footage of a first audience reaction to the original Halloween somewhere on YouTube. And these people are losing. It's so fun to watch these people just really be into it. Yeah. But he is, he is actually known as much as a film composer as he is a director. Mm. Um, in fact, in fact, he, John Carpenter hasn't directed anything since 2010. And mm. he did a movie called The Ward. Um, and that was the first thing he had directed probably since 1999 with Ghosts of Mars. He doesn't mm. direct it. More. He 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 loves fucking video games. He loves watching the Lakers, and he he likes making music. In fact, you can we can purchase tickets to go and see him at like we can go and watch a John Carpenter concert in which he his son and his nephew they play all of the music from all of the movies that he scored. So he does Halloween, oh. Escape from New York. He does Prince of Darkness. He, he does all of he does Big Trouble in Little China. He does, in fact, this the, the ending theme in Big Trouble in Little China, which is titled Big Trouble in Little China, is sung by him, and the music is composed by his band, the Coupe de Bills. So hmm. John Carpenter was originally, he was his father was a music teacher in Kentucky. And so he comes from a super musical family. And so he is one of the rare directors that scored a lot of his films first because out of necessity, he didn't have the money to score Halloween. He didn't have the, the money to score uh, Assault on Precinct 13, uh, two of his best scores, I think. Um, so it was out of necessity. And then people were like, it's just, he just nailed it so hard yeah. that it's impossible to think of his films without him doing the scores. And, yeah, so he, he sits in a very special place, not just in American cinema, but in cinema in general, because most directors aren't musicians. Um, yeah. I would say the closest corollary we have to a John Carpenter is, again, Quentin Tarantino, because Tarantino, while Tarantino is a musician, Tarantino has this genius level intellect of how to know what songs to pick to put in his films. His, his soundtracks are so amazing. Um, he knows how to drop what song at what time and just really esoteric songs that a lot of people don't really know about, songs from the 60s and 70s. And sometimes, I mean, in let's take um, Jackie Brown. 
mm. one of my favorites of his. Yeah. I have been listening just to the score, the soundtrack of that film since 1997 when that fucking movie dropped. I mean, it's that good. So there just yeah. aren't a lot of people like that that have that musical genius with that director's eye. So yeah, Carpenter is really special. And I, you know, you know, time permitting, man, I would encourage you to start watching all of his stuff, but watch his stuff in order. Start with Assault on Precinct 13, and then I think that he did Halloween after that. Um, that you know, all his stuff, and you'll notice it'll say music composed by John Carpenter, mm -hmm. and almost impossible to visualize any scene from any of his movies without also hearing his music. Wow. That's wild. I didn't know that he also composed that. I mean, the uh, the Halloween theme song is one of the most famous theme songs in history. I mean, I think that was a that was my my cell phone ringtone for like three years. Uh, you know, you know what I mean? I love that. I mean, you know, I would think it's, you know, maybe a close second would be Jaws. Yeah, you know, and that's yeah, it. But but yeah. really, it's the the you know the king of the hill in terms of the minute that starts playing. Yeah, you know what it is. It's yeah. you. I mean, I can't even conceive of a single Halloween. I mean, the holiday of Halloween. I mean, everywhere you go, you go to parties, Halloween parties. You go into stores. They're playing the Halloween theme. Like it is synonymous with Halloween. Um, and yeah, it's, very, it's like you know. John Carpenter's Halloween theme is to Halloween what uh, Mariah Carey's I Don't Want a Lot for Christmas is to Christmas. You yeah. know, it's, it's hard to even conceive of the holiday without certain songs. You know? Sure. But yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I'm, I'm happy you like this movie, man. Uh, I, I really did. You, might. you know, it's, it's a dude's movie and you're a dude. Like, you know, you, you have a respect for... I was excited for you to see this movie because I knew you would notice stuff like, oh, they didn't fuck around. They didn't try to, they didn't phone in the martial arts. They didn't yeah, phone no. in the, they didn't phone in the fighting. They didn't phone in the choreography, you know, and every, you know, they, they didn't fuck around with time. I was never bored. I was, I was really excited. I was almost certain you were going to love this film for those reasons. And I was just really happy to hear that you, you picked up on all of it. Yeah, no, I it. really did. I loved it, man. I mean, you recommend some of the best <clears throat> films ever to me. Um, I mean, you know more about film than anyone else I know. And the way you can pick certain things apart and see things that I wouldn't normally see. And um, yeah, just your recommendations <clears throat> are, are thoroughly appreciated. Um, you know, I know it took me a while to watch that film, but um, it wasn't for any other reason than just... Oh, no, well, yeah. and and, and yeah. you know stuff like that but um yeah i'm super stoked to watch the next film i think i'll probably do prince of darkness next and then we can review that one um yeah. just because i haven't seen that and i've heard of it so much and now you've mentioned it again so that's probably another, what i'll watch next yeah man it's a prince of darkness is it's got a following now but it, it it's it's a sleeper when people talk john carpenter the, I would say what are the, the ones that really come up the most Halloween escape from New York. And I'm trying to think here. Let me go. Let me look at his filmography. Well, uh, BTLC, obviously. Oh, and the thing and the thing. Those oh, are yeah. The big, that's the, oh, the and you also did the fog. Didn't you do the, the, fog? the fog? The fog. Dude. Okay. I come, I, I knew I was forgetting something. I was like, yeah. Salt on precinct 13 was 75. Halloween was 78. And yeah. then I jumped to 82 with, but yeah, the, the Fog was two years after Halloween. Yeah. The fog, man, you talk about another fucking film. One, he nails it. It is, it is the best ghost story I've yeah. ever seen put to film. Yeah. Yeah. He also did the score for that one. It's also one of my favorite, when, again, once when we get to Halloween season, the two soundtracks I play the most, I play the Halloween suite, A and B, that he did. And I also do the score to the fog because it's a very different feel. It's got a lot of, it's got a lot of um, light piano to it. Yeah, and it's a very different type of. It's it's very it's because Halloween is so synthesized. 
there's a little bit more um, instrumental in the fog. Yeah, like instrumental. The fog is yeah. another one we should do. Have, have you seen the fog? Yeah. Okay. The, awesome. the, the only Carpenter films I've seen was The Fog and Halloween. Okay. And I no, mean, that now, makes sense. now, now well, those are up in Little China, but yeah. Yeah. Those are, yeah. I mean, those are, he's, he's known for his horror stuff and obviously Big Trouble isn't, isn't horror, but that makes sense. No. And both of those movies are masterclasses in, in what they do in terms of genre, you know, Halloween, it's, it's, it's just, he doesn't explain a whole bunch of stuff and that's really what makes it more interesting. The fog, you know, people just living their lives and this weird thing happens and then it just goes away and you're just sort of left like, what the fuck? Like he doesn't, that's another key to mm. his films, especially the films he wrote, is that he gives you enough detail but he doesn't over explain shit. And, and the, I think what, what is ruining a lot of modern film is mm. we get too much origin. We get too much why. I don't necessarily need to know that. Drop me into a situation where I've got to fight or figure my way out and mm. make that the movie. That's way more interesting than the dark forces. It's how people fight against the dark forces that are way more interesting. Yeah, I totally agree. That is really interesting. And that's what Big Trouble Little China did so well. We didn't get this huge backstory on Wang. We didn't get this huge right. backstory on Burton, right? It was just right. like right into their lives. And then by the end, you kind of had a sense of who they were. Right. And, and then that's yeah. and that's exactly right. And, and, you know, you take a character like Egg Shen, who is he's 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 the good sorcerer. And I don't need to know where he learned his magic. I, yeah. don't need to know, I don't need to learn how he casts his spells and how he does. I just, I look at Egg Shen, I look at the man who's playing him, and I hear him talking, and I hear him, you know, talking to Jack and talking to Wang, and it's a testament to Carpenter's casting. I immediately buy Egg Shen. There's yeah. nothing about that man. It's like, okay, he gives tours through San Francisco Chinatown. Oh, and by the way, he knows white magic and he's yeah. able to vanquish demons i'm like oh i totally buy it oh i believe this guy does both of those things i don't need an adjustment period i don't need to hmm i wonder no this dude does this and i'm in in you know for all of it yeah that character was hilarious oh, man he so was fun. uh is he the dude that played um mr miyagi no, he no? came up in that. No, Pat Mo Pat Morita was uh, Japanese American. Uh, played Mr. Miyagi, the okay. guy who played Egg Shen. Let me go back here. Uh, his his name is Victor Wong. Okay, he did he did a lot of. Um, I remember seeing him in a lot of rerun television from the seventies. And yeah. believe it or not, the dude worked a lot throughout the eighties and yeah. I think part of the nineties. Like if you if you go and look at his filmography. Uh, despite the fact that in the, in those days um, they they weren't <clears throat> they they couldn't conceive of Asian leads, he worked yeah. a lot, and, and actually yeah. he, both he and <clears throat> uh, David Lopin, uh, the guy, the gentleman who who played David Lopin, uh, yeah. who is a legend. His name is James Hong. James Hong was I mean I remember seeing James Hong as a young man. I feel like in black and white rerun television from the 60s, mm. um, I remember seeing him in rerun television in the 70s, he has worked consistently. In fact, um, he's still alive. He's 95 years old. Oh, wow. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been around. He was in Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Um, he has been, he's one of the voices in the Kung Fu Panda films. Yeah. Um, the dude is just an absolute badass. And, and that's the thing is that, you know, I think sometimes people only, I, I, I take it back. I think it's impossible to just focus on Jane or uh, uh, Kurt Russell in this movie. Because oh, yeah. you've, got, you've got these other incredible actors in there. Dennis Dunn, Victor Wong, James Hong. Um, it's, and even, even though the three wizards in this film uh, thunder, rain, and lightning don't have a whole lot of um, lines. Yeah, their screen presence is 
unfucking believable. When those guys yeah. show up and they, they, you know, they come down on their lightning ladders, it's like, yeah. fuck. Like you really feel like okay. Like if, you know what it is. When this movie dropped, I believe it was a precursor to the video game Double Dragon. And you look at Double Dragon, you look at Mortal Kombat, they got so many aesthetics from this film. You look at, uh, at, you look at uh, Lightning, for example. Uh, the guy with, the, I guess they all had the hats on, but yeah. the guy who had the metal and who could you know, shoot Lightning. Yeah. You, wouldn't have, you would not have had Raiden in Mortal Kombat without this movie. There's, yeah. it's, this is the second movie um, that I've reviewed for Cult of Film in yeah. a row that really is informed by so it's it's a western film informed by eastern sensibility and eastern genre that then goes on to create and influence video games or eastern genre like with um yesterday i i, I did a review of, of the animated film fist of the north star okay. and that was a movie that was influenced by mad max early sylvester stallone movies Ooh. um and then ended up being primary influences for Dragon Ball Z uh, mm. and a whole bunch of other like martial arts anime. And that's something that needs to be said for Big Trouble in Little China is this movie in so many ways gave us these other franchises and video games like Mortal Kombat that we just yeah. take for granted. Then you go and watch this movie and you're like, oh shit, yeah. that's where this came from. So, you know, Carpenter was a genius, man. And... I, I wish that he would have been better treated yeah. as he was going through. Because now we celebrate him, but yeah. you know, he's an older man now, and, and he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't give a shit anymore. He's playing video games, he's making music, he's he tours, but he Carpenter was. I don't think he was ever truly as celebrated as a Scorsese yeah. or William Friedkin. And you know, William Friedkin got his ass handed to him a couple times too. Um, but <clears throat> it's interesting. I just. I think one of the one of the great one of the great I think lessons of a film like Big Trouble in Little China and frankly Carpenter's career is that in the end good work wins that the critics might have been able to silence it but good work always rises to the top you know it's it's like got its ass kicked in the theater made a shit ton of money on video and is now held in wide, wide regard by film nuts such as myself is like, no, you yeah. have to see this movie. So it's, 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 it sort of uh, gives you hope that the good will ultimately win out. And it was yeah, a good movie. The and it prevails. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of like Van Gogh, the artist. He, right. When he was, when he was painting and alive, he, he, he literally sold less than five paintings when he yeah. was alive <laughs> and now he's renowned as one of the greatest painters to ever have done it. Right. Um, so there's sort of a correlation there with Carpenter. Well, it's it's great art. And, and no, th that's absolutely right. There are people that it's crazy to think about somebody like Van Gogh. And like th this guy, you know, I mean, he he just couldn't get it going. And, and now it's just like you think it's it's um, it's wild. It's really wild. So I'm glad that. Carpenter is at least getting his flowers now. later in his life. You know what I mean? So th at least there's that. Um, yeah. This bring, I guess that brings us to the portion of our episode where uh, usually what I do is in addition to we talk about the movie, it's programming. If you were doing to do a double feature of Big Trouble in Little China with another movie, what other movies? And they they could be martial arts, they could be action, they could they don't have to necessarily match up genre wise but if you were to program a double feature and one of the movies was big trouble in little china what other movie might you pair this movie with hmm, that's a good question i mean i wish i i had thought about that before we got on and i should i should i should have mentioned this um oh good question i mean i'm gonna probably go with <laughs> probably a martial arts film sure. um mm. Enter the Dragon, Bruce oh, Lee. Oh, dude, that's what I picked. That's so. Totally oh, really? What I thought. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I would be like, it would be a perfect pair, right? Yeah. No, probably. Enter the Dragon. Yeah. Great film. I mean, 
Yeah, that would be it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's Bruce. It's Bruce that it's. It, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I, there's. Yeah, you don't really need much more than that. I mean, it's Bruce Lee at the height of his powers. That movie was so well directed. Um, yeah. You know, oh I mean, yeah, oh, that's my so favorite good. Bruce Lee film, honestly. Um, yeah, he, you know, he had a lot of bangers, but um, that was the one that you chose. Yeah, I mean that was one of them. I mean, I yeah. would, I guess, I mean, if you wanted to go the route of, if you wanted to go the route of martial arts films, yeah, I think definitely Big Trouble in Little China with Enter the Dragon, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, or if I was gonna go, okay, we're doing a John Carpenter night, I'm, and it was Big Trouble in Little China, man, there's not a whole lot of other stuff in his filmography that matches per se but i'm you know what i might do i might i might reduce it to kurt russell i'd be like okay we're gonna do yeah. big trouble little china and then we're gonna follow it up with escape from new york that's what i would do I that's think interesting that, that could work too or do escape from new york and then do big trouble you know watch them sure. you know chronologically but Sure. Yeah, there's again, Big Trouble in China is such a unique film that it just it doesn't. It's like a very specific food that doesn't yeah. pair with a lot of other stuff. It's right, you know, that type of thing. It's like a like a Chicago style hot dog works really well with French fries. Yeah. It works well with a Coke. It works well with onion rings. But after that, there ain't a whole lot, you know, because it's a specific type of thing. And it's such a specific type of genre mixing movie that you've either got to go the Bruce Lee route, the martial arts route, or you've got to go, okay, we'll just do another Kurt Russell movie. Like there's not a whole lot of yeah. out there, but that works, man. Yeah. Works. yeah. No, I'm that's really cool. excited. I like that aspect of this, uh, of this broadcast that you, you know, um, pairing the movie with another movie. That's, that's cool. I like that. You know, and it, it's, it's, it's something I try to do with my movie nights. Sometimes, yeah. you know, a certain movie is so long or a certain movie is so powerful that you just have to talk about it afterwards and you can't yeah. just roll it, can't yeah. roll into the second movie. Um, but yeah, that's some, it's fun to pair stuff because sometimes we'll, maybe we'll review a movie for the channel and people will be like, ah, it's not my thing. And then, oh, but they said they would pair it with this. Okay, you know, maybe I will watch that movie. Yeah. So... But no, man, I think the next one for us to tackle should be Prince of Darkness. I yeah. think we, could, we should get balls deep in John Carpenter films. I think so. And, and, and review them. Because, I, again, you, you, as an artist yourself, as a creative dude, you can absorb, I feel like, a lot more than the average bear. And so yeah. that's why I like... Because we obviously, you know, people don't know, but, you know, we did you know, movie nights, you know, for a while before you had to go. East. Yeah. Before I came out uh, East. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so, you know, and when you get back, we'll get back to it, but yeah, man. Yeah. And no, we will dude. We got a whole life to oh, live yeah. here. Oh, you yeah, know, absolutely. it's, we're both yeah. young. It's um, yeah. It's really good to see you. Um, it's good to be back on the pod. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to watch it later. Prince of darkness. If I can, yeah. Whatever and, you, uh, you know, it hit it, hit it up in another couple days. Yeah, man. If yeah, if yeah, we can do it in as few as you know a few days. Um, just let me know, man, and I'll be I'll be ready to rock and roll. But miss you too. You look great. Seems like it's been really great for you out there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we can't wait for you to get back because we've got yep. not in addition to obviously more pods to do. Man, I've got a stack of scenes I want to shoot with you. Me too, man. I know. I mean, yes, I want to yes. do that too. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you meant. I know what you meant. But no, I, it's, it's great connecting with you, man. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. It Let's was. Do it again soon. And uh, be safe, okay, buddy? Yep. And thank you to all the viewers. We love you. Thank you. All right. Talk to you next episode.